As you know, my name is Renee, and you're watching Renee's Health Corner. Uh, believe it or not, God really does care about your health. Now, last year in 2022, just about anywhere you looked, sickness and disease was on the rise. In the United States alone, someone had a heart attack every 40 seconds. 1.4 million Americans are diagnosed with diabetes every single year, and one in two people will get cancer in their lifetime. <coughs> Excuse me. It was estimated there would be 1.9 million new cancer cases and 609,360 deaths from cancer in the U.S. in 2022. There's also a rise in the number of strokes per year, gastrointestinal problems, arthritic conditions, uh, MS, uh, and a host of other diseases. The question is why? Well, many believe that God is the the fault and the blame, and, but that's not really the case because in 3 John 2, we're told that God wants us to prosper and to be in health. So if God wants us to prosper and to be in health, then it's not his fault. It's got to be some other reason. So um, I'd like to bring something uh, to your mind for just a minute, something that many of us have learned in our lives and at some point growing up, um, that there's many different types of laws. We have civil law, natural law, laws of physics, sanitary laws, laws of gravity. Uh, take gravity, for example. We all know that what goes up must come down. Well, there's other laws known as natural laws. And when these laws are neglected in any way, the result is sickness and disease. And over a period of time of neglecting these natural laws, more severe um, cases can even happen, for instance, like cancer. <clears throat> Excuse me. But remember, all the information I share is um, supported by the Bible, spirit of prophecy, medical research, or, and or medical science. And um, anyway, over the last uh, many weeks, I've been covering the letter of N, which stands for nutrition. And um, last time I went over the subject of uh, salt. So today I'm going to be talking about um, bread, um, which is the staff of life. In the Bible, we're counseled to eat that which is good. Isaiah 55, 2 says so. And the word good here means that which is best, which also means beneficial. So according to the Bible, God wants us to eat those foods that are best for our health and healing and beneficial to us. And he wants us to eat foods that promote health and healing. He doesn't want us to be sick. And he's told us what to eat and what not to eat so that we can have better health. <clears throat> so anyway, before getting into today's subject, I want to share a couple quotes with you. One's from the Bible, one's from the Spirit of Prophecy. And the Bible one is Psalms 103, verses 4 and 5. It says, Who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who satisfieth thy mouth with good things. Now, that's not the whole quote, but those are the main points from those verses that I wanted to share. And... Um, the one from Spirit of Prophecy is Ministry of Healing, page 128, says, Too little attention is generally given to the preservation of health. It is far better to prevent disease than to know how to treat it when contracted. And it is the duty of every person for his own sake and for the sake of humanity to inform himself in regard to the laws of life and to conscientiously obey them. That's Ministry of Healing, page 128. And then also you can read Genesis 3.19 and um, Isaiah 33.16 on your own. 
We're also told that education should be given on proper diet, counsels on diet and food, page 406. And that's my goal here is to educate you on proper diet. Many people don't read our books or they don't know. They don't know what to read. They don't know where to go. And so the Lord has put it on my heart to um, make these videos and to educate you on our diet. We're told that disease is an effort of nature to free the system from conditions that result from a violation of the laws of health. And that's Ministry of Healing, page 127. We're also told in violating the laws of health, even when doing the service of God, we misrepresent, uh, you misrepresent your maker. And many people do that, you know. They think that, well, I'm, I'm doing work for the Lord so I can stay up late. I can eat this unhealthy meal because I'm, you know, I got to go do something for the Lord. Or I don't have time to exercise. I don't have time to get in the sunshine. I don't have time to drink my water, et cetera, et cetera. But that's not true. We need to make time to take care of ourselves. We're also told in uh, Child Guidance that we should educate ourselves not only to live in harmony with the laws of health, but to teach others a better way. And that's my goal, is to teach you a better way. So Matthew 6:11 says, Give us this day our daily bread. Getting into today's subject about bread. And Psalms 104:15 says, Bread strengtheneth man's heart. Now here's some facts about whole grain bread. It's high in antioxidants, dietary fiber, essential fats, uh, minerals, starch, vitamins, and other things. Bread really is the staff of life. It is the real staff of life. Councils on Diet and Food says so too, which lines up right with what the Bible said. Now, in Bible times, I'm going to tell you how bread was the staff of life. For Adam, it says in Genesis 3.19, In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread. Now, Abraham, it says, Genesis 21, 14 says, And Abraham rose up early in the morning and took bread and a bottle of water and gave it unto Hagar, putting it on her shoulder and the child and sent her away. Uh, Jacob and Esau, Genesis 25, 34 says, Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Moses and the children of Israel, Exodus 16, 4 says, Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day. And then in the days of Christ, Matthew 14, 19 says, And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass and took the five loaves and the two fishes, and looking up to heaven, he blessed and break and gave the loaves to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude. Then in the days of the disciples, Acts 2.46 says, And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Now, bread is essential for good health. There are uh, very many girls who have married and have families who have but little practical knowledge of the duties devolving upon a wife and mother. They can read and play upon an instrument of music, but they can't cook. They cannot make good bread, which is very essential to the health of the family. That's 3T 156 paragraph 2. So we need to encourage the eating of fruit and vegetables and bread, we're told in Councils on Diet and Foods, page 314 paragraph 5. And then um, we're told in Ministry of Healing, page 302, that it is a sacred duty for those who cook to learn how to prepare healthful food. Many souls are lost as a result of poor cookery. It takes thought and care to make good bread. But there is more religion in a loaf of good bread than many think. So mothers, we need to teach our children how to cook. I know I taught all my children how to cook. And even working with some of my grandchildren when they'd come over, they'd, Grandma, can I dump this? Can I dump that? Can I pour that? Can I do that? Sure. They'd stand up on the chair and get up by the counter and help me. <clears throat> So, um, Councils on Diet and Foods, page 316 says, It is a religious duty for every Christian girl and woman to learn at once to make good, sweet, light bread from unbolted wheat flour. What's unbolted wheat flour? That's whole wheat. Unbolted is not the white. It means whole wheat. 
So uh, M267 says we need a genuine education in the art of cooking. Form classes where you may teach the people how to make good bread. I remember doing a cooking school many years ago and, and was um, teaching how to make bread. Many people don't know. I didn't know. I had to just practice and try and do it because I had nobody to teach me 30 some years ago when I started making bread. Anyway, bread is the real staff of life and therefore every cook should excel in making it. CD 315 paragraph three. So we need to practice and that's all it takes is just practice. Go on YouTube and watch a video and watch what they do and learn how to make good healthy bread. Now, here's some educational principles regarding uh, making good bread. Number one, it's to be light and dry. Council on Diet and Foods, page 315 says, bread should be thoroughly baked inside and out. The health of the stomach demands that it be light and dry. And number two, to be light and sweet. Bread should be light and sweet. Not the least taint of sourness should be tolerated. The loaf should be small. Council on Diet and Foods, page 316. We don't want these great big loaves that some people make, you know, um, just the regular size bread pan is fine. Nine by, it's a nine by five. You can also use the, the smaller ones. I think it's like eight, eight by four or something like that. I don't remember now, but there's one that is a little bit smaller, but I use the nine by five. Um, heavy bread breaks down organs. Heavy clammy bread are breaking down the digestive organs of tens of thousands. CD 343 paragraph three. Number three, bread should not be eaten when fresh. When the yeast is used, it should be uh, eaten when it's two or three days old, so 48 to 72 hours. Um, Council on Diet Foods, page 316 says, when hot or new, raised bread of any kind is difficult of digestion. It should never appear on the table. This rule does not, however, apply to unleavened bread. Fresh rolls made of wheaten meal without yeast or leaven and baked in a well-heated oven are both wholesome and platable. Bread which is two or three days old is more healthful than new bread. And Council on Diet and Foods, page 317, paragraph 2, says that. Now, <clears throat> the reason is, is because the yeast germ has to die. It's, it's fermented, and so you have to wait till it dies, and then the bread is fit to eat. Now, we're told whole grain is best. Number This is number four. Ministry of Healing, page 300, says, For use in bread making, the superfine white flour is not the best. Its use is neither healthful nor economical. Fine flour bread is lacking in nutritive elements to be found in bread made from whole wheat. It is a frequent cause of constipation and other unhealthful conditions. CD 316 says it is a religious duty for every Christian girl and woman to learn at once to make good, sweet, light bread from unbolted wheat flour. Again, that's whole wheat flour, not white flour. <clears throat> Number five, wheat grain bread is not to be eaten day after day. We should have a mixture of grains. Making a mixture of different grains is more nutritious. And that comes from Councils on Diet and Foods, page 321 says, all wheat flour is not best for a continuous diet. A mixture of wheat, oatmeal, and rye would be more nutritious. Now I've done that too. Put in a little bit of rye flour, a little bit of oatmeal, uh, not oatmeal, oat flour um, or oatmeal. You can make the oatmeal too. That's good too to put in there. Makes it give a little more moisture. But just use different grains, you know, at different times. You just, just don't make whole wheat all the time. But it's okay to have it. It's just not all the time. <clears throat> now, number six, no baking powders to be used or baking soda. We're told in Ministry of Healing, page 300, the use of soda or baking powder in bread making is harmful and unnecessary. Soda causes inflammation of the stomach and often poisons the entire system. Now I did a, a video on baking powder so you can go watch that and learn about baking soda and baking powder and what it does to the body. Anyway, many people ask me, well, what do I use then if I can't put baking powder in my cookies or my muffins or whatever? And I tell them just use yeast, but then you have to let it, you know, rise and then wait the 48 to 72 hours before you eat it. Number seven, use water instead of milk. Um, you can use um, just plain water. That's all you need. You don't need to use any kind of 
milk whatsoever besides it's expensive. And the quote says, Ministry of Healing 301, in the making of raised or yeast bread, milk should not be used in place of water. The use of milk is an additional expense and it makes the bread much less wholesome. Interesting. Number eight, bread should be thoroughly baked inside and out. Um, Ministry of Healing again, page 301 says, let ordinary raised bread be cut in slices and dried in a warm oven till the last trace of moisture disappears. Then let it be browned slightly all the way through. In a dry place, this bread can be kept much longer than ordinary bread. And if reheated before using, it will be as fresh as when new. Then again, we're told the loaf should be small and so thoroughly baked that as far as possible, the yeast germs are destroyed. As I said before, that's why you wait the 48 to 72 hours. Councils on Diet and Foods, page 316. <clears throat> Now, bread uh, dried out in an oven is the best for health. Dried bread in the oven is one of the most wholesome articles of diet. I believe she's uh, talking about toast. That's Council on Diet and Foods, page 317. And number nine, bread should be made without vinegar. Uh, 20 Manuscript Release, page uh, two says, they are not educated in regard to the injurious effects of meat eating and of using sugar and vinegar, tea, and coffee. Now, much of the bread today is made with vinegar. Be sure to read your labels. I was so disappointed when um, Dave's Killer Bread, he sold his recipe and got millions for it. And then what he did is, or what the new company did is they um, went and changed the recipe. And guess what they put in it? Vinegar. It's the very at the very end, but they put it in there. I was so disappointed because that's a really good bread to have. Um, like if you're traveling and, you, of course, you can't make your own bread. <clears throat> or sometimes we would just buy it for a treat. It is kind of expensive, but it was excellent bread. I, it's just so disappointing they wouldn't put vinegar in it. Anyway, uh, uh, another uh, brand of bread you can buy is Ezekiel bread. Now, I'm not really fond of that because it's kind of dry like for a sandwich but for toast it's good so we're also told number 10 says we can use yeast in the making of raised or yeast bread many people try to say oh no don't use yeast don't use yeast yes you can just be careful and read your labels because they put junk in yeast too you have to make sure you get the ingredients that just say yeast you don't want to, i can't think of what that ingredient's called now i'd have to look it up but there's it's two words and um, it's not good for you. So be careful when you buy your yeast. Now here's some benefits from eating bread. It reduces the risk of coronary heart disease and constipation by 25 to 36%. It can help with weight management. Uh, risk of diabetes type two drops 21 to 27%. The stroke risk drops by 37%. It reduces your cholesterol levels. It reduces your risk of asthma your risk of cancer, your risk of polyps, um, it reduces constipation problems, and much, much more. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, there's um, a book called Science in the Kitchen by um, Ella Kellogg, which was Dr. Kellogg's wife, and on pages 109 to 140, um, she has some uh, the science of bread and how to make it. Now, not every recipe in that book is perfect because that was, you know, written way many, 1892. And they used to use milk and cream and butter back in those days when it was safe, but not now. But if you look on pages 23 to 25, um, there's a how to make unleavened bread is in that book. And I'll have the link posted below. Um, <clears throat> like I said, you know, just be careful with some of the recipes, substitute um, milk for almond milk or soy milk or whatever kind of plant milk you use. And then if they call for eggs, use an egg substitute. It's real easy to, um, you know, change a recipe. Now, I'm also gonna post a recipe for whole grain bread, a simple, easy one that's just flour, water, honey, yeast, salt, and olive oil. And um, you can uh, find that below, a simple, easy bread recipe if you wanna start practicing making bread. And um, we're also told that bread's gonna be given to God's people during the great time of trouble. Here's the quote, Isaiah 33, 16 says, he shall dwell on high, his place of defense shall be the muticians of rocks, bread will be given him, his waters will be sure. And then uh, the Lord has shown me repeatedly that is contrary to make any provisions for our temporal wants in the time of trouble. I'm reading from um, early writings now, page 56. 
<clears throat> I saw that if the saints had food laid up by them or in the field in the time of trouble when sword, famine, and pestilence are in the land, it would be taken from them by violent hands and strangers would reap their fields. Then will be the time for us to trust wholly in God and he will sustain us. I saw that our bread and water will be sure at that time and that we shall not lack or suffer hunger. For God is able to spread a table for us in the wilderness. If necessary, he would send ravens to feed us as he did to Elijah or rain manna from heaven as he did for the Israelites. Now, isn't that an interesting thought? We might be able to taste manna. Wow, I bet that stuff is delicious. And can you imagine just walk, you know, being somewhere and, and all of a sudden here appears a table for you of food to eat from the Lord? Wow. I'm also going to post below some links about the importance of homemade, um, of whole grain bread, I mean. And you can see those links uh, below as well. And uh, here's something else to know. Sister White hated bread at one time, but she forced herself to eat it to the point of loving it. And here's the quote. This was amazing to me when I first read this. Councils on Diet and Foods, page 483, paragraph 4. And it says, I suffered keen hunger. I was a great meat eater, but when faint, I placed my arms across my stomach and said, I will not taste a morsel. I will eat simple food or I will not eat at all. Bread was distasteful to me. I could seldom eat a piece as large as a dollar. I'm assuming she's talking about the coin dollar. Some things in the reform I could get along with very well, but when it came to bread, I was especially set against it. When I made these changes, I had a special battle to fight. The first two or three meals I could not even eat. <clears throat> I said to my stomach, you may wait until you can eat bread. In a little while, I could eat bread and graham bread too. This I could not eat before, but now it tastes good and I have had no loss of appetite. Wow, isn't that amazing? I just thought that was such an amazing quote. Who would think that somebody would hate bread? I don't know. I love bread. <laughs> anyway, I have a book that I recommend, again, called Health Power by Dr. Hans Deal, who was known for the CHIP program. His books have over 2 million copies in 17 languages in circulation. And this book covers the subject um, that I've talked about, uh, many of them that I've talked about, and some that I uh, will do in the future. It also includes the natural laws that I've talked about, and if you want to purchase a copy, you can find it on Amazon or do a Google search. Well, anyway, that's our time for today. And I hope that what you've heard on here will be a blessing to you and to your family. And until we meet again, may the good Lord bless and keep you. And remember, God loves you and wants you to be in health. So eat that which is good. God bless. Bye-bye.